Hi everyone, this is just a quick announcement before we get started on chapter 87. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone for following along and being so encouraging and just generally super kind. I have a question for all of you about Cirrus's cousin, a dromedeer, which I've been saying a dromedeer, but I know that um, some people read it as a dromedar, I think. Um, I've always said it that way in my head when I was first reading the books, and so I'm sorry it came out automatically like that. The people who've corrected me, I know you are right because I know it's spelt like that. Um, so if you guys could just comment which one you prefer for me to say, whether I just continue how I've been doing to keep it in the continuity of it, or if you want me to change, and from now on I will pronounce it correctly. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Enough of me, let's get started. Chapter 87, Fifth Year, Morning After Tuesday the 11th of March, 1976 Hello, Grant. Watch your Remus. How are you? How am I? How are you, you silly twat? You're the one having made up conversations with me. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay, I'm not busy. I'm not even real. You are real. I just can't talk to you in real life. And I don't know where you are, even. Nothing I can do about that. What's up? I kissed Sirius. Bloody hell. What should I do? How should I know? Didn't I tell you not to? Yeah, but he kissed me back. For a minute, at least. Sure you're not just imagining that? Yeah. Remus gave up at that point. He had been lying awake in bed since at least five o'clock in the morning, alternately panicking and soaring with joy. He had to be mad. Mental. Crazy. Bonkers. Lost it. He would thought that talking to someone else might help, but who could you talk to that early in the morning? Especially when it concerned a secret, which could very well get you expelled, for all Remus knew. Unable to find a solution by talking to an imaginary person, or at least an imagined version of a real person, he returned to his previous, somewhat less constructive diversion, trying to relive the three minutes on the staircase with Sirius that night, without reliving the part where they both ran away from each other. Did he regret it? Was it too soon to tell? On the one hand, Remus might as well just have ruined the best friendship he had ever had, or ever would have. On the other hand, it had been a bloody good snog. In Remus's limited experience, he thought it probably made sense that just because you really madly fancied someone, it didn't mean that when you finally kissed them, it would be as good as you'd imagined. And Remus knew that he had a very vivid imagination sometimes. But Sirius was serious. It had been anything but disappointing. It had been perfect, in fact. As long as you pretended that the last part hadn't happened. Stifling a groan, he scolded himself and tried to think rationally. Approach it like an essay, he thought. Lay out all the facts, then make your argument. So, the facts. A. Remus Lupin had kissed Sirius Black full on the lips. B. Sirius Black had not immediately thrown a punch. C. Sirius Black had actually kissed Remus Lupin back, despite what the imaginary Grant had to say. D. Sirius Black had also kissed Mary MacDonald immediately afterwards, and with considerable vigour. E. Sirius Black had not come to bed. At all. Bollocks. Remus climbed out of the bed. It was no good lying there tossing and turning. He had to get out of the tower. Sirius's bed lay empty to his left. If he wasn't in it, then he was most likely in the common room. To be safe, Remus took James's cloak. He was good at being quiet and moving without a sound, but he needn't have worried. Sirius was dead to the world. He lay on the couch, head flung back, the perfect line of his jaw exposed. Mary was curled up against his chest, a patchwork quilt thrown over the two of them. Remus hurried past, wanting to get as far away as possible. The prefect's bathroom was probably one of the weirdest places in the castle. Remus had thought the older students were teasing him when they gave out the password in the train back in September. 
He went once, and once only, in first term. He couldn't get past the thought of actually removing all his clothes in such a big open room. What if someone came in? However, on this particular morning, it was the only place he was sure he would not be found. Even if the marauders decided to use the map, they couldn't come in and find him without the password. He reached the fourth floor and whispered, squeaky clean, at the entrance before slipping in. No one was in there. It was much too early. He had often wondered whether there was some kind of mechanism in place to stop anyone else getting in while you were in the bath. He had so far seen no evidence of this and decided to play it safe. Stripping down to his boxes and vest, Remus ran the water and pumped a lot of bubbles into the Olympic swimming pool-sized bathtub before sliding in, still in his underthings. The bathroom was one of the most beautiful rooms in the castle, Remus acknowledged. Everything was clean, white marble and glimmering golden taps. The stained glass windows depicted a series of gorgeous shimmering sea creatures. A lovely tangerine smell was rising from the great white drifts of foam, and Remus finally began to relax. He had never learnt how to swim. The St Edmunds boys were offered lessons down at the local swimming bath for free, but Matron wouldn't let him go. He hadn't minded. He didn't want the other boys to see his scars. But now he was older... He thought he'd like to learn. Sirius had once talked about family holidays in the south of France, where the sea was warm enough to bathe in. Remus couldn't imagine that. The only sea he'd ever seen was at South End, and once Margate. It was bloody freezing, a dirty grey-green colour, not the crystal azure Sirius had described. Still, Remus could float. He lay on his back and stared up at the ceiling. Having fun? Not really. So, if he kissed you back, then ran off, then kissed Mary, where does that leave things? I don't know, do I? That's what you're supposed to help me figure out. Right, right, calm your tits. You don't say that. Sirius says that. Look, I'm doing my best, I told you. I'm not even real. Maybe I was a really bad kisser. Maybe. The real Grant is a lot nicer than you, you know. Yeah, well whose fault is that? You're the one talking to yourself, you nutter. Find someone real to talk to. Remus sighed, frowning. Could you be a bad kisser and not know it? Probably. He didn't have enough experience to know. It hadn't felt bad. It felt like they fit. He kissed me back. Remus knew, deep down, that it had nothing to do with how he'd done it. It was the very fact that he'd done it at all. He knew it, but he wasn't ready to address it yet. Not even with an imaginary person. If he was being thoroughly truthful, Remus knew that Sirius had every right to run away, to be shocked, confused, or even frightened. And there was a mad kind of Sirius Black logic behind snogging the very first honest-to-God girl he could find right after something like that. Once again, Remus was confronted with the image of Sirius pressing Mary up against the mantelpiece, those hands on her waist that had been on his waist only moments before, and he kicked involuntarily, forgetting to stay afloat. Spluttering and choking as he went under, Remus scrabbled back to the surface and came up coughing, orange-hued foam going everywhere. Remus, is that you? A girl's voice echoed across the bathroom floor. He struggled to wipe his hair out of his face, blinking, and just made out the blurry outline of Lily Evans in a pink quilted dressing gown. He rubbed his eyes hard, his feet finding the floor, and choked out. (coughs) Hiya, Lily. Christ, are you okay? Thought I'd have to dive in and save you there. Lost my balance. I can't believe you beat me to a bath. I thought I'd be the first up. Got a filthy headache. Lily rubbed her forehead with a pained expression. Yeah, that punch was pretty strong, Remus replied, though he felt fine. I was just getting out, uh, do you mind turning around? Oh, okay, sorry. Lily smiled, turning her back. Remus moved to the side and pulled himself up out of the warm water with some reluctance. He felt silly and girlish, asking her not to look. James or Sirius probably wouldn't have cared at all. Grabbing a towel, he wrapped it around himself, over his shoulders, rather than around his waist. 
It wasn't exactly manly, either, but he didn't need Evans asking about his scars on top of everything else. Okay, he said, hurrying into a changing cubicle. He heard Lily running the taps again, and a sweet lavender smell filled the room as he dried off and changed into his uniform. So, where did you disappear to last night? Lily called, over the noise of the running water. We must have gone on until at least two. Potter was so pissed. Must have got a bit too drunk, Remus called back. Went to bed at midnight. Lightweight, Lily teased. He heard the taps go off and a soft splash as she got into the bath. Still, she carried on, at least Sirius and Mary made up. Yeah, that was lucky, he replied evenly, exiting his stall. Lily was bobbing about at the far end of the pool, her red hair piled on top of her head, surrounded by a sea of purple foam. She smiled at him. Library, he said, feeling awkward and clammy, fully dressed in the warm, steamy bathroom. Of course, she laughed. Where else? Oh, did you see that notice in the common room? No. He shook his head. He had not looked at anything but Sirius in the common room. Career meetings with McGonagall have been posted. Mid-April. Oh, good. Rumors felt his limbs grow heavy. Thanks. It was a relief to be out of the hot bathroom, and rather than the library, Rumors decided to go outside for a bit, to the greenhouses and back, maybe. There were sometimes a few Hufflepuffs hanging around there dealing pot, and even though it was a school day and he hadn't had breakfast yet, this seemed like a very good idea. This is all your fault, you know. How's that? If you hadn't snogged me last summer, I'd still be... Oblivious? Confused? Normal. That's a bloody lie and you know it. Wanting to run away is the only normal thing about you. Fair enough. You've glad I snogged you. You bloody loved it. Yeah. You're only annoyed because Sirius didn't react the way you did. Yeah. The question is, why the bloody hell would you expect Sirius to act anything like you? Why indeed? This was the first bit of useful advice Imaginary Grant had dredged up, and Remus clung to it. Sirius needed to do whatever it was Sirius needed to do. It wasn't for Remus to decide. He congratulated himself on being very mature about this whole thing. After all, he thought, at least it's done now. At least you know what it's like. Could you survive forever? He wondered. On one kiss? Fortunately, there were indeed three Hufflepuffs sitting on the grass behind the greenhouses, two girls and a boy. They smiled at him in that friendly, stupid way that told him they had started early, and in slow, gentle tones congratulated him on the excellent party. He sat with them until he couldn't ignore his hunger pangs any more, and staggered back to the castle dizzily for breakfast. There he is! James boomed as Remus took his place at the table. Peter, who had his head in his hands and looked a bit green around the gills, groaned. Not so bloody loud, Prongs. I'm begging you. Oh, eat your eggs and you'll be fine, James grinned. Remus piled up on his own plate with two fried eggs, two sausages, a pile of baked beans, three slices of toast, two slices of fried tomatoes and three rashers of bacon. He felt very calm and comfortable now. He could tell himself that it had been the bath, but it obviously wasn't. I can't tell if you're hungover, or it's just that incredible metabolism of yours, Marlene grimaced at his plate. Bit of both, Rima shrugged, tucking in. And something else, James wagged his finger. Been down at the greenhouses already, Mooney. Is this how you want to enter your seventeenth year? Yes, Remus said, mouthful. Sirius was there, of course, but he hadn't said anything yet. He was propping his head up sleepily on one elbow, nursing a large mug of milky tea. Remus stared at him intently, willing him to look up, but he didn't. Mary was nowhere to be seen. 
McDonald being a wimp, Marlene explained, pulling a sickie, even though everyone saw her down an entire bottle of witch's brew by herself. She did? Remus said. Wow, impressive. She probably deserves a lion then. He meant it sincerely. We're all feeling rough though, Marlene said. Evans was chucking up for at least an hour before bed. Is she okay? James asked, scandalised. Yep. I saw her this morning in the prefect's bathroom, Remus said, swallowing his mouthful. She's okay. In the bathroom? James raised an eyebrow. You've got to stop your philandering ways, Remus. Give the rest of us a chance. (laughs) Oh yeah, that's me, Remus snorted. The Casanova of Gryffindor Tower. He'd only said it to make James laugh, but Sirius's head finally snapped up, his eyes resting on Remus. There was a tiny, almost imperceptible frown knitting his brow. He looked at Remus as if he was an incantation he hadn't yet worked out how to pronounce. Remus looked back steadily, allowing this scrutiny. He would allow Sirius anything. Another moment and it was over. Sirius looked away, saying nothing. Chapter 88, Fifth Year, Stalemate Tuesday the 16th of March, 1976 By the time the next full moon arrived, it became clear that Remus and Sirius had reached a stalemate. Remus had tried being indirect, catching Sirius's eye during meals, or the rare evenings where they were all together. He tried hanging back in the dorm room to see if Sirius would stay behind too, but no luck. Sirius's eyes never met his, and he was always the first to leave a room with Remus in it. Short of actually ambushing Sirius somewhere, which he refused to do, Remus was running out of options. The plea for another phone call with Grant was returned, with a note in Matron's neat, brutally clear handwriting on the envelope. Recipient no longer known at this address. He was completely alone. Once, Remus thought he'd got close to catching Sirius. They were leaving charms, and James had stopped back to talk to Professor Flitwick, and Peter had nipped to the loo. So Remus and Sirius found themselves waiting alone in a busy corridor. He seized the chance, saying quietly, Look, about the other night. Yeah, we were all so pissed, right? Sirius laughed loudly. Loud enough for people to turn and look. Mental! Can hardly remember half of it. Uh, yeah, right. Remus withdrew. It was a complete lie. They both knew that. But it was one of those awful cases where neither of them was supposed to acknowledge the lie, just keep stepping over it. You couldn't push Sirius any further than he was willing to go, and he was clearly not willing to go... there. Then, of course, there was Mary. If Sirius did want Remus in the same way Remus wanted Sirius, then surely the Mary thing would be over. But no, Remus was going to have to come to terms with the fact that it wasn't the Mary thing, it was his best friend's relationship, and it wasn't going anywhere any time soon. She was everywhere he was, and more often than not, on his lap. During this time, Remus briefly flirted with the idea of legimency. Being able to read Sirius's mind was very appealing. He soon gave up, finding it much more difficult than anything else he'd ever attempted. Plus, with his revision schedule now in full swing, he had very little room in his head for new spells. Now, on the night of the full moon, Remus sat alone in the shrieking shack, waiting for his friends to arrive and not sure if they would be two or three. He was getting a bit paranoid, actually, but that wasn't Sirius's fault. In an attempt at escapism, Remus had been spending more and more time down at the greenhouses, spacing out and filling up with dozy green smoke. Not ideal. Better than drinking, he supposed. Better than getting detentions for stupid pranks. He'd smoked that particular day to calm his nerves around the moon, and to see if it had any effect on the transformation pains. Though goodness only knew what a stoned werewolf would be like. A sharp pain seared his shoulder blades, and he gasped with surprise. Well, that was the experiment done with. Evening, Mooney, 
The door opened, and James poked his head around. It's starting! Remus clenched his jaw. Hurry up! Get in! James quickly transformed, and was followed into the room by a large brown rat and a big black dog. Remus closed his eyes, relieved. The night of the full moon was no different from any other they'd had so far. As animals, they were less conscious, or perhaps just less concerned by their more human problems. The wolf only wanted to run and hunt, to roll about in the undergrowth and chase the black one and play fight the big one. The next morning, he felt refreshed and invigorated, or at least he would have if it wasn't for the bone-crushing agony of returning to human form. Some things never changed. The marauders crept out, only twenty minutes or so before Madame Pomfrey appeared to take Remus back to school. In the hospital wing, she gave him his usual deep sleep potion, and he did not open his eyes until well after midday. This was always going to be a problem, he had realised lately. No matter how much his monthly transformations had been improved, he still lost so much time. He'd already checked, and found that the May full moon did not coincide with any exams. This seemed very odd to him, until he realised that it must have been orchestrated this way, by Dumbledore or McGonagall. He found that a bit embarrassing. Didn't they know he had sat through classes before, with his blood boiling and his muscles aching? That he had finished essays after being up for two days, head throbbing and so tired that he had only adrenaline left for fuel? And he had still beaten half the class. He could do it. They just had to let him. How would he ever get a job after school if he couldn't be seen to be keeping up? When Remus opened his eyes at about four o'clock, he was very surprised to see Sirius there, alone. Morning, he smiled softly, a trace of anxiety still clinging to his features. That might not be because of Remus. Sirius was often anxious these days. If Snape was Remus's malevolent shadow... Then Regulus was Sirius's. It seemed, even if you left the Black family, in everything but name, you were never really free of the sense of obligation. Or the guilt. That could be the case with all families, Remus reflected. He wouldn't know. Morning. He nodded back, pulling himself up. Good night, wasn't it? Yeah, great. Sirius nodded, eager for some familiar territory. Can't believe we found that waterfall. Prongs reckons there's a cave behind it. Told him if there is, then a troll probably lives there. They like caves, don't they? They do, yeah. It wasn't awkward exactly. They chatted like this all the time. But they didn't usually struggle to keep a conversation going. Quite the opposite, in fact. Sirius was looking up at the ceiling. Then out of the blue he said, We're okay. Aren't we, Mooney? His voice was small. Course, Remus said hurriedly. Because you, you, James and Pete, you're my best mates. Yeah, you're my best mate. You all are. Okay, good. Sirius looked relieved, and Remus was glad he'd said the right thing. But his face seemed to grow troubled again. There's... There's Mary just now, too. Mary, Rumors repeated. Yeah. I said I'd go meet her. Pete'll be along in a bit. No, it's fine. Once Madame Pomfrey's back, she'll probably let me out. I'll see you this evening? Yeah, of course. Sirius grinned, looking more comfortable than he had in weeks. We understand each other now. See you at dinner, mate. He said this last word with an overly blokiness that was very unlike him. Remus was surprised he didn't punch him on the arm or knuckle his hair. Wednesday, the 14th of April, 1976. The next month passed in a blur of quills, books and parchment. Remus couldn't be sure whether or not he and Sirius were still at odds because he simply didn't have the time to worry about it. When they did see each other, in lessons, in the corridors, or yawning goodnight to each other before bed, everything seemed perfectly fine. 
Remus's study group had doubled in size, and Dealey had to break them up by different subjects for each day of the week. The sessions mostly took form by running through past papers written from previous years, sharing their answers, pointing out key extracts from their various textbooks. Remus felt that he was learning just as much as he was teaching, and he was really enjoying it. "'How come you're not in Ravenclaw?' Christopher asked one day, as he helped Remus tidy up the disused classroom where they had been practising levitation. It was a mess. "'My dad was, actually.' Remus smiled softly. That didn't hurt as much as it used to. There are other things, much more important. And the hat did mention it at my sorting, but not to be. Seems like you would have been better off there, Christopher said, repairing a shattered inkwell and cleaning up the black puddle beneath. Maybe, Remus shrugged. If you'd known me then, you wouldn't think so. They finished this job, and Remus glanced at the clock. Shit, I have to go. Sorry, Chris. Will you be okay getting back to the tower? Pure blood privilege, Christopher said, making a face. I don't get bothered. Where are you going? Uh, it's private. Sorry. Thanks for the help. He had to run, in the end, to get to the hospital wing in time. Madam Pomfrey scolded him slightly. No physical exercise on full moons, she said, fastening her cloak. You'll get yourself agitated, and we've had such a good year. I'll be fine, he waved a hand, a little too casually. Maybe he ought to get prongs to scratch him up a bit, so that she didn't get too suspicious. No way would prongs do it, though. They began to walk out into the grounds together. A journey so familiar now they could do it in their sleep. I could do this bit on my own now, he said, conversationally. I know how it works well enough. You'd only need to get me in the mornings, then. Sorry, dear, she shook her head. Dumbledore's orders. I'm to make sure you're safely off the grounds on time. Oh, of course. He tried not to sound ungrateful. Of course, that was a concern, that he might forget or run late. Then what? It would be much worse than this, he thought, once he turned 17 and had to register with the ministry. Inside the shack, Madame Pomfrey shrieked. What's wrong? Remus withdrew his wand. Oh, nothing, she clutched her chest. I I saw a rat. Horrible things. Sorry, dear. I wish we could find a nicer place for you. Oh, it's fine. See you in the morning. When the door closed, he spun around. Pete, was that you? Sorry, Mooney, Peter's voice came from upstairs. I was supposed to be keeping guard. He came down the staircase, followed by Sirius and James, who were yawning and looked as though they'd just woken up. What are you two doing here? Remus asked, surprised. What about the match? We've been sleeping since the final bell, James explained. Then we'll get another hour or two kip in the morning, and lunchtime, if we can swing it. You're mental, Remus shook his head. Both of you. He looked at Sirius to check if they were still playing the eye contact game. Anything for our Mooney. Sirius said, holding his gaze for a good few seconds before dropping it, looking away and rubbing his arm. This satisfied Remus, though he knew he ought to feel guilty. He didn't know why he took so much pleasure in watching Sirius squirm. We're early, Peter said, sitting on Remus's little cot. Aren't we, Remus? Yeah, I think so. He stretched a little, to get a feel for his various aches and twinges. Yeah, I'm way off. Oh, good. Can I go back to sleep? Sirius yawned. He and James had settled themselves on the floor, and Sirius was resting his head on James's shoulder. Fuck you, James, Remus thought, before stopping himself. He leaned against the wall, self-consciously. Oi, when's your appointment with McGonagall? James asked. 
shrugging his shoulder to shake Sirius off. Uh, first thing next Friday. Why? What are you going to say? Say? About careers, idiot. Oh, right. Sirius stifled another yawn, his eyes watering with tiredness. Ugh, I don't know. Don't really fancy the idea of a job much. Father wanted me to go into politics, so I suppose not that. My mum says it's bad time to join the ministry, Peter said thoughtfully. But Desi reckons it's the best time when the war's over we'll be on the ground floor to rebuild. Well, there's one way of looking at it. Sirius raised an eyebrow. He nudged James. Go on then. Tell us what your plans are. Hmm? James looked at him innocently. Oh, come on, Potter. Don't tell me you haven't got it laid out in front of you. Poddlemere? Hollyhead? The cannons? Who's shown the most interest so far? Actually, James raised his head in a very dignified way. If you must know, they've all inquired, according to McGonagall. But I'm turning them down, for now, anyway. Oh yeah? Going to have a gap year and live off your millions? No, you git. I'm going to fight. There was a weird sort of pause. Sirius looked deeply troubled. Remus broke it. You what, mate? Well, James looked uncharacteristically nervous about this. The war won't end unless people fight it. Mum and Dad are working so hard and... Well, I couldn't be any kind of son if I didn't help. Would I? Dumbledore needs as many people as he can get. Plus, he laughed shakily, if Wormy wants a job at the Ministry, we'd better make sure the Ministry is still standing, right? So, when you speak to McGonagall, you'll say... That Quidditch can wait, that I want to do everything I can to make sure the wizarding world is safe for everyone, not just purebloods. Yeah, pretty much. James ended, simply, looking down at his hands. Quiet again. Finally, Sirius muttered. Then that's what I'll say, too. Mate, you don't have to. What else am I going to do? Retire with my uncle's inheritance and let you all have the fun? Piss off. Me too, Peter said suddenly, eager to be included. I can help. Of course you can, James beamed. You're a marauder. That's basically the best qualification you can have. What about you, Mooney? Peter gabbled, excited and bright-eyed. I'm going to... Mm. Too late. Here it comes. Shit. Change, quick! They all leapt up ready to take their animal forms. The last thing Remus saw clearly were his three friends standing together, thinking about their futures. Chapter 89, Fifth Year, The Week Before Friday the 23rd of April, 1976 Good afternoon, Mr Lupin, Professor McGonagall smiled as he entered her office. Good afternoon, Professor, he replied politely sitting on the chair opposite her desk. All ready for your exams? Uh, I think so. I have every faith in you, she smiled. McGonagall's smile was given only when she felt the situation deserved it. For this reason, Rumour smiled back. The middle-aged witch looked down at a pile of parchment smoothed out before her. Notes from his other professors, perhaps. She cleared her throat looked up and smiled again. You have received consistently strong results during your time at Hogwarts. Not the old time, he murmured, thinking of those wasted months in first year. You are a prefect, McGonagall continued, a generally well-behaved, thoughtful young man. You seem to excel in your charm work and history, and I hear you have gathered some pupils of your own. I just don't mind helping out, he explained, embarrassed, if people get stuck. An admirable quality, Mr Lupin. Uh, thanks. So, 
she said briskly. With all of these good things in mind, have you given any thought to a career to pursue once you've completed your education? He was nervous, he realised, more nervous than he expected to be. He rubbed his damp palms on his trouser legs and tried to make eye contact. I'll have to register myself with the ministry. He saw her purse her lips, but she didn't interrupt. And, I mean, I don't know much about it, maybe not as much as I ought to. But, the war. What about the war, Lupin? She snapped. Well, people, wizards. They don't want someone like me, with my problems, to have jobs and all. So I thought, We cannot submit to others' low expectations of us, Lupin. You have done great things at Hogwarts, and I have no doubt you are capable of greater things still. Maybe, he shrugged. But I won't get the chance unless... unless I get involved, I suppose. Get involved. Any trace of kindness or encouragement had left her face. Yeah. Mr Lupin. McGonagall's brows furrowed. She looked tired, as though she'd been working on a difficult problem all day. You know that I have already spoken with Mr Black about his own plans. Yeah? Remus wasn't sure what that had to do with anything. And I'm sure you can imagine exactly what Mr Black's plans are. Uh, I could guess. He didn't need to guess. They had all discussed it that night, all four of them, on James's bed. James had always been the head of the group, the leader. His innate goodness, his confidence and his easy-going demeanour had ensured this from their very first meeting on the Hogwarts Express. But now, to Remus at least, it seemed to have taken on a new dimension of wise heroism in his decision to join Dumbledore and pit himself against Voldemort. If James was doing it, then they were all pretty sure it was the right thing to do. Sirius had spoken at length, and with some emotion, about his own desire to beat them. Remus had the impression that Sirius didn't see the war as political, so much as extremely personal. Voldemort might as well have been his mother, or his father. Peter was always excited to begin a new venture, and Remus had to admit that he was impressed. Wormtail was usually the first to point out the risks in such a plan. But James had made it seem so easy, so simple. As for Remus, there was never any question. He had no other options, as far as he could see, and the least to lose out of all of them. The three boys he shared a room with had been his primary concern for the past five years, and he saw no reason for this to change when they left school. And he couldn't deny, even to himself, that staying close to Dumbledore seemed the most likely route to Greyback. He said none of this to McGonagall, of course. The professor removed her spectacles, rubbed her eyes and covered her face with her hands. She sighed, and the sound struck Remus in a painful way, in the pit of his stomach. He had disappointed her. Mr Lupin, I have interviews with Mr Potter and Mr Pettigrew later this afternoon. Am I to assume that I will hear the same things from them? Don't any of you have any career ambitions beyond this dreadful war? Remus shrugged, looked at his feet. She wouldn't change his mind. There'll be time for that, he mumbled. Afterwards. She lowered her hands, replaced her glasses and looked at him. Her eyes were rimmed red, slightly puffy. She wasn't giving him her famous look, trying to unnerve him into giving the right answer. The expression she wore was something different entirely, one that didn't suit her at all. He didn't like it. (sighs) I didn't become a teacher for this, she said, very quietly, her voice strained. He didn't know what to say to that. He felt sorry, but he didn't want to say so, in case she pounced on this as an avenue to dissuading him. I think Peter wants to do something at the Ministry, he offered. Afterwards. Well, that's a start, at least, McGonagall smiled tightly, 
and reshuffled her papers. Now, Mr Lupin, let's talk about newts, shall we? Thursday, the 14th of May, 1976. Shakily, Remus made his way to the very top of the Quidditch stands. He found his friends, Lily, Mary, Peter and Desdemona, waiting excitedly as the crowd began to cheer. He sat next to Desdemona, who was wearing Peter's red and gold scarf. Hi, Desi, Remus smiled and gave a little wave. Uh, are you cold? I'm trying to blend in, she giggled. Petey thought they wouldn't let a Ravenclaw sit here. Oh. Should you be here, Mooney? Peter asked, watching the players walk out onto the pitch with a pair of binoculars. Feeling okay? Oh no, have you been ill again, Remus? Desdemona said sympathetically. Oh, uh, Remus was just, uh... Peter stammered, realising his mistake. Out by the greenhouses, Remus said blandly. I'm stoned out of my mind. He was stone-cold sober, but Desdemona was an innocent sort of girl. Uh, okay. She smiled politely, but inched away from him slightly. He had slipped out while Madame Pomfrey was in her office. He felt bad about it and would apologise later, but he had to see his friends play. They would do the same for him. It was Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff today, and the crowd opposite them was decked out in glorious sunshine yellow. It had rained in the night, Remus knew this because he'd woken up with wet hair and feet, and the skies were a clear spring blue. Knowing that James would see this as very good omen, Remus smiled to himself and cheered along with his friends. It was a good game, a great one for Sirius, who was in particularly good form. He never missed a bludger, and at one point made an impressive swing right back in the nick of time to save the third Gryffindor chaser, leaning so far over that Remus was sure he would topple to the ground. There's not going to be another party if we win, is there? Lily said over the cheers as James scored his fifth goal. I don't think we can cope with another one this close to exams. Not if James has got anything to do with it, Remus said. He won't want to throw away the hours he's been putting in at the library. Library? Yeah, he's been there almost every day, Peter filled in, revising his bloody arse off. He's even more of a swat than Mooney these days. I don't believe you, Lily raised an eyebrow. (laughs) Believe it, Remus laughed. He's even enforced dorm room rules so that he can get enough sleep between exams. We have to be completely silent after eight o'clock. Another cheer went up, the sixth goal for James, twelfth overall for Gryffindor. Ha! Peter roared. They'll never catch up now! Gryffindor won, of course. Remus wasn't sure if James had yet lost a game. As soon as the final whistle had been blown, all of the Gryffindor students poured out onto the pitch to congratulate their team. Mary was at the head of this, having run down a few minutes ahead of everyone else. Remus, as ever, was behind. He didn't usually mind, but with the moon so close behind him, he was still pretty sore, and his limp more pronounced than usual. It was probably better if he waited for everyone else to get down, he thought, less people to notice him struggling. Madame Pomfrey had once or twice suggested a walking stick for when his hip was very bad but he wouldn't hear of it. Remus was almost all the way down the rickety wooden steps and could see James and Sirius at the centre of the red-robed mob on the Quidditch pitch. James looked up and waved at him, and Sirius caught on, waving too. Remus grinned widely, hoping they could see it, and stuck a thumb up of way of congratulations. As he did so, something very sharp and hot stung his ankle, just as he'd raised it to descend another step. With a yelp of surprise and pain, Remus tumbled forward, losing his balance completely and clattering down the rest of the stairs, landing in a heap at the bottom. Ow, he thought. Fuck, he said, pushing up with sore splintered hands and trying to get to his knees at least. The problem with being so lanky, he thought, was there was more of you to get knocked. Dazed and confused, 
he was grateful that most of the crowd had their backs turned to him. He must have fallen at least eight steps down. Then he heard it, the muffled giggling. He turned, pain shooting up his left side as he did so, and saw three faces hiding underneath the wooden scaffolding. It was Mulsaba, Barty Crouch, and Snape. Oopsie daisy, Crouch cackled, showing rows of sharp white teeth, a little too small for his mouth. Poor Ickle Lupin. He was fiddling with something small and metal. Tossers, Remus muttered, righting himself, hauling his body back up as quick as possible. He fumbled in his trouser pocket for his wand, praying it hadn't been broken. No, it was fine. He withdrew it and pointed it between the gaps in the steps. His ankle was throbbing, an itching, biting pain. What did you do? Don't blame us for your clumsiness, loony lupin, Snape said coldly, stepping backwards into the shadows. And get that wand out of my face before I report you for drawing on unarmed students. Unarmed my ass, Remus growled, still aiming his wand. Expelliarmus. But nothing happened. They really were unarmed. What did I tell you, gentlemen? Snape sneered at his cronies. Loony Lupin is dangerously mad. Emphasis on the danger. Crouch was beside himself now, giggling maniacally as he tossed his little metal coin between his hands, like some weird juggling act. Was it a sickle? No, Remus could smell it now, even as they were backing away. It must be a prefix pin. A silver one. Oi! he yelled, suddenly. But they just laughed and kept walking. By the time James and Sirius, who had seen Remus stumble, but not much else, reached him, the three Slytherins were gone. Bloody hell, are you okay, Mooney? James asked, helping him straighten up, offering an arm. Fine, yeah. Must have tripped. Stupid long legs, yeah? Remus tried to smile. Sirius was there, and he refused to mention any kind of Slytherin attack with Sirius around. He was too unstable, too reckless these days. The hot, angry itch in his ankle was driving him mad. He hoped Mertlap Essence helped that too. Bloody Snape, what had he done that for? None of the three who'd attacked him were prefects. So where did they get the badge? And more specifically, why the bloody badge? The girls had arrived at the scene now, and were making a fuss, telling Remus to sit down and take deep breaths, asking whether this or that hurt. It was no good saying that nothing hurt, after he'd just fallen headfirst down a flight of stairs, and it was no good saying that everything hurt, but that he'd had much worse. And all the while his mind kept going back to the sting in his ankle, and the words Severus had used. Dangerous. What did he know? Or what did he think he knew? Remus, you're really awfully pale, Lily was saying. Marlene placed a hand on his forehead, and he batted her away, irritated. I'm fine, he said. All right, give him some air for Merlin's sake. Sirius, who had, until now, said nothing, suddenly burst out, pushing them all out of the way. Remus looked up, squinting through a few locks of stray hair, to see Sirius with his determined face on. He put his hands on his hips, in a very good imitation of James delegating jobs for pranks. You lot go to the changing rooms, or the Great Hall, or wherever you're supposed to be. Mooney, come on, let's go back to the castle. We'll go by the hospital wing. Prongs, you'll take my broom back. Remus almost opened his mouth to protest. He couldn't possibly go to the hospital wing, which he's only just escaped a few hours ago. Madame Pomfrey would never let him leave again once she saw the mess he'd got himself into against her orders. But Sirius was offering him a way out, so he took it. He accepted the offer of Sirius's arm and got up stiffly. Ow, he thought again. He'd badly bruised one of his knees, and his hip was worse than ever. He staggered slightly, but Sirius allowed him to lean into him. He was still in his crimson Quidditch robes, 
trimmed with gold, though he'd taken off the helmet. His hair was coming loose from its ponytail. He smelt mildly of perspiration, fresh air and grass. I'll come too, Mary chirped, getting up. She was taking her position as Queen Consort of Gryffindor very seriously. No, it's fine, Sirius said, firmly but kindly. We don't need a big fuss, do we, Mooney? Come on. He gave Mary a quick peck on the cheek, before leading Remus down the last few steps and off the Quidditch pitch, back towards the castle. Remus pulled away, as soon as he thought he could walk unassisted, and Sirius let him, but kept a steady pace, so that it would take them a long time to get back. We don't have to go and see Pomfrey, if you think you're okay, he said quickly. I just thought you'd like to get away from that lot. Yeah, cheers. Remus nodded, cautious. I know you hate people worrying over you. Yeah. Mooney, how did you actually fall? You never fall over, even after a moon. Oh, uh, I don't know. Wasn't looking where I was going. Sirius seemed to accept this for now, and they kept walking. It must have taken almost half an hour for them to make it all the way back up to Gryffindor Tower. Sometimes, Remus wished he was a Hufflepuff, if only for accessibility purposes. Finally there, Remus collapsed onto his bed, aching all over and completely exhausted. He hated being that way in front of Sirius. He didn't want to show any signs of weakness. I'm just going to have a shower, if that's okay, Sirius said quietly. Remus nodded, closing his eyes. Once the bathroom door clicked shut, he fumbled in his bedside table for the Mertlap essence. He'd need more after the next moon, though this jar had lasted longer than any other one he'd had, thanks to the marauders. He raised his trouser leg and found the pinprick. Bastards. It was angry red and raised slightly, like a mosquito bite. The skin around the puncture was turning deep bruised purple, The Mertlap essence didn't help at all. Definitely silver, then. Remus lay down and tried to ignore the pain, allowing his muscles to relax and sleep to take over. He was still lying in this dozy, slightly feverish state when Sirius emerged from the bathroom, a waft of muggy steam and faint aftershave. Are you sleeping? He whispered, so gently. Almost, Remus murmured, opening his eyes just a bit. Sirius drew the curtains closed, dimming the light in the room. He stood by Remus's bed. He picked up the jar of Mertlap essence. What's this for? Cut yourself? No. Mooney, please tell me what happened. It obviously wasn't an accident, Sirius frowned. Don't you trust me? Of course I trust you, Remus frowned back. I just, look, I don't need you going out for revenge, okay? It's stupid, and it'll blow over. Who? Three Slytherins. They tripped me, yanked my foot through the stairs. That's all. Cowardly gits. Best not to mention the silver. Which Slytherins? Sirius' voice was hard. Not Regulus, Rumors replied. Snape, obviously, Mulciber and Crouch. Sirius, he said, as sternly as he could muster. I'm fine, okay? Please don't make it worse. I won't, Sirius said, though he sounded uncertain. They were quiet for a bit. Remus closed his eyes again, his eyelids heavy. Shall I leave you to sleep? Sirius asked, his voice gentle again. Yeah. Cheers, Remus murmured, relaxing. I'm knackered too, Sirius said, lightly with a half laugh. After that match, sort of jealous of you for having the excuse. Almost wish I could lie down here with you and not get up again until tomorrow. Remus opened his eyes again to check Sirius's face. But he was looking away. Better go down for the feast, though. Can't miss James's victory speech. Don't go near the Slytherins, Remus said. Promise. Promise, Sirius nodded. 
He left the room shortly after that. And Remus fell asleep, feeling satisfied that no matter how much Sirius hated Slytherin, he would never do anything so reckless that Remus could not forgive him. End of chapter 89